Hello and uh, good morning to all of you and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here for this special occasion uh, of the PES University. Uh, I am very happy to come and tell you a little bit about uh, the journey of physics. So I'll take you over the next 18 minutes uh, through a journey going from the very, very large to the very, very small. Since I won't make it very technical, le let me uh, present it as something like uh, um, a snapshot from a trek. So imagine that some of your friends have gone for a trek to the Himalayas and have come back and are showing you some snapshots. So that's what I will try to do, try to tell you, uh, give you a few glimpses of the sort of uh, a different kind of uh, vista. In that journey of physics, uh, it's a bit like traveling across the Himalayas and you, the scenery is often very uh, enchanting and you come across very grand peaks. So uh, I'll try to give you a glimpse of, some, of two of the major peaks of theoretical physics of the last century which are coming together at present in the 21st century. So that's why in a sense I'm calling it like going from Kanchenjunga to K2, uh, going in a journey across the Himalayas. Uh, the first universal law of physics in some sense that was proposed because universal because it applies not only to the earth and all the bodies under the earth's gravity but also to the sun, the solar system and beyond uh, and in fact uh, we know that now that uh, I mean we've known since Newton that uh, these describe the motion of planets quite well and uh, even today this is what our planetary scientists like at the ISRO used to, uh, to calculate the trajectory of a spacecraft like the Mangalyaan or many of the other rockets that we uh, send out. And the Newtonian uh, description is a very accurate one for most purposes. But the, the interesting thing in physics is that uh, when uh, you learn sometimes that the laws that you study, which are valid in a certain uh, domain, become uh, approximate when you try to extend that domain. And in this case, when you go to the very, very large, so not just the level of the solar system, you go to even beyond, uh, go to even larger scales of the universe, you learn that Newton's law is only approximately true. And I want to just give you a glimpse of that. Uh, and this is the insight of Einstein, uh, who realized that the force of gravity is actually best understood in terms of geometry. Uh, and this sound, sounds very surprising, but, and it was very a radical notion when Einstein proposed it over a century ago. Uh, and it is the idea that uh, what, uh, the, what we think of as the force of gravity is really that the massive objects are curving the geometry of space and time around that object in a, a bit like what is shown on the, uh, the slide here. So the satellite which is moving in the Earth's orbit is really moving in a straight line but in this very curved space-time because that is the shortest distance, that's the shortest path that the satellite takes in this curved geometry. So he, Einstein gave an alternative picture of gravity in terms of the curvature of space and time. It, it, to mathematically uh, express that, you have to know some of the mathematics of differential geometry and the Einstein equations, which you can see Einstein writing over there, it gives a precise way in which you can describe that curvature uh, uh, given any mass or any other object. And the remarkable thing is that it reduces to Newton's laws in when the velocities are small, when the densities are small. It actually reduces to Newton's laws, so you understand why Newton's law is a good approximation for many purposes, but you realize that uh, the underlying Einstein's picture is a better uh, description as you go to, uh, to more extreme circumstances. So, uh, so let me try to tell you why you really need Einstein's theory. So in the universe, there are extreme astrophysical events like neutron stars you might have heard of. These are very dense stars 
formed after they have almost totally collapsed. Similarly, pulsars, which are these rotating uh, objects in very fast rotating objects that you see on the left-hand side, or black holes, which you can see at the center of galaxies, like ours, uh, a typical galaxy is shown on the right side here. So these black holes, these neutron stars and pulsars, to describe them, you, can, uh, you have to use Einstein's theory, uh, because there is uh, the whole notion of a black hole arises in Einstein's theory, and this is something you might have read was recently confirmed in the LIGO gravitational wave um, detection. Uh, but I also want to point out something which you may not be aware of. Even the GPS system on your phone uh, requires some of the corrections due to Einstein's theory to accurately locate your phone. So if you, uh, if you were to not take that into account, you can be off by a few meters by the end of the day because the, the way the GPS works, you send a signal to some satellite, and the satellite being in, up, uh, in outer space feels a different gravitational field from what you feel, and there's a difference in the time due to the curvature of the space-time, and you have to take that into account. So a very abstract theory like Einstein's theory in terms of the geometry of space and time has a down-to-earth consequence in the smartphone that you hold in your hands. And you will see that again and again, uh, how fundamental physics in the end impinges on your life. Uh, so, so I was giving you a picture of Einstein's picture of gravity in terms of this geometry, and this is the best description we have to, for the universe at the very largest scales. And when I mean the largest scales that we have explored, these are about a million times the size of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is the galaxy uh, in which our star, our solar system is a small star in the corner of this galaxy, and it, uh, we have now understood uh, the universe had a million times that scale, uh, and uh, this is a picture of sort of a clusters of galaxies. Uh, uh, so this is the very, very large that I was talking about and how uh, Einstein's theory has given us a very successful description of the universe uh, all, almost till this, from the, almost from the very origin of the universe till this largest scales that we can see today. But to understand the origin of the universe, I need to take you to the other end, namely the second part of my talk to the very, very small. And this is what is remarkable, that the very, very large and the very, very small get interconnected. And because to understand the origin of the universe, we need to actually understand something called quantum mechanics. Maybe you have heard of quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics, in a sense, underlies all uh, the atoms we are built from, they are uh, the constituent particles, the electrons and the protons, they all owe their existence to quantum mechanics, which is a description which goes beyond the classical mechanics that we learn in high school. And it is uh, necessary to describe the very nature of the atom. The atom wouldn't exist in, classical, in a classical description, and quantum mechanics came about to try to understand and explain the atomic structure uh, of the world. Similarly, another of Einstein's discovery was the quantum nature uh, of light itself, that light we think of as a wave, but it also has a particle-like nature. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, there is this particle-wave duality, which is uh, captured by this very nice uh, this thing. If you look at it one way, you see light is a wave. And if you look at it the other way, you can see light is a particle. Do you see that? Both ways of... Uh, th that's the idea that quantum mechanics, there's a duality between waves and particles. And, uh, and so you see the dot. Uh, and the wave, both, uh, they, are, they are dual notions and quantum mechanics makes this precise for both electrons, protons, as well as for photons, which are the uh, essential quanta of light. Uh, and uh, once again, you might think this is a very abstract theory, which uh, perhaps has nothing to do with our uh, real world, but once again, you, uh, perhaps your 
uh, aware already, but the basis of all modern electronics and gadgetry, all the computers, the smartphones, uh, this uh, laser pointer, this, uh, this LCD display, uh, the digital cameras that you use, everything is, un the underlying technology is built from on the basis of the phenomena of quantum mechanics. If we didn't know quantum mechanics, we would never have been able to come up with these inventions. And uh, someone has actually estimated that uh, 30% of the GDP of the US is based on quantum mechanics. So you see all modern technology is based on this very abstract understanding that physicists uh, derive in trying to understand the very smallest constituents of nature uh, uh, described by quantum mechanics. Uh, so. Um, so this is the other side, the very, very small. In fact, quantum mechanics not just describes the uh, atom, but we have now gone to a billion times smaller than the atom in understanding what uh, physics is. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, incredibly hard to imagine that it's nine orders of magnitude smaller than the size of an atom, which is 10, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Uh, uh, so this is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, where they are actually exploring these very small distances, uh, these incredibly small distances, and quantum mechanics is a very successful description all the way for the electromagnetic and the so-called weak and strong interactions, all the way to these very tiny distances, much smaller than an atom. So the picture that one had at the end of the 20th century, in a sense, uh, was, uh, might seem that we are sort of done. We have an amazingly successful description of the cosmos from a billionth of the atomic size to a million times the scale of the Milky Way. It's a huge uh, span of uh, length scales or energy scales, and it's truly amazing that humanity has been able to piece together a consistent description of the universe uh, at this, uh, uh, through all these scales. But you might then ask, oh, so are we done? Do we understand everything completely? But no, once again, this is why our understanding you always find has limitations. You, just like Newton's laws had its limitations, we have limitations in, in trying to understand the force of gravity at the very, very small distances. We understand, in a sense, the other forces that I mentioned in the previous slide, the electromagnetic or the nuclear interactions or the radioactive interactions which cause radioactivity like the weak interactions. We understand all of them at the very, very small scales, but gravity we understand at very, very large scales, but we don't understand at very, very short scales. In fact, what you say is that we lack a theory of gravity at the quantum level. Einstein's theory is a theory which is applicable at the very, very large uh, distances, but uh, breaks down or has limitations when you go to the very, very small uh, uh, distances. And this is where string theory enters. There was a picture which... Uh, uh, so uh, string theory uh, enters as a description in which you replace the notion of fundamental particles by extended objects called strings, just like rubber bands uh, or uh, pieces that can be sort of open strings or closed strings, and their vibrations give rise to different particles. And uh, this, all has, uh, this uh, framework also has the ability to describe the gravity and gravitational force at the quantum level. So this is why string theory has been uh, pursued very uh, vigorously and, um, and has managed to now give many insights which connect the quantum mechanics to gravity, so the very, very small to the very, very large. Uh, so you might think once again, uh, why, why should I care about quantum gravity? Well, uh, to uh, describe the origin of the universe, uh, as I said, you have to understand quantum mechanics because that's when uh, the very tiny quantum fluctuations in the universe actually got magnified and became all the galaxies and other things that we know. So in a sense, we owe our existence to the uh, tiny quantum fluctuations that happened in the very origin of the universe. So uh, uh, then there are puzzles associated with black holes, uh, which are again very... Uh, 
uh, amazing objects, which are predictions of Einstein's theory. But Einstein's theory tells you that something very strange must be happening inside black holes, uh, and uh, you need a quantum description to understand them. And this is where Stephen Hawking, uh, who passed away recently and who all of you have heard about, uh, he made one of the first important advances in understanding the quantum nature of gravity because he re realized that black holes, when you include quantum effects, the effects of quantum mechanics, they actually start radiating like a black body uh, and they have a temperature and this is called the Hawking temperature and maybe you have studied some thermodynamics, you know that in thermodynamics there is a concept of entropy which measures the complexity, the underlying structure of a a uh, thermodynamic object like a gas or a... See, so Hawking's great discovery was that black holes behave like thermodynamic objects. They have a temperature, they have an entropy, and one of the triumphs of string theory has been to give an understanding of this celebrated formula of Stephen Hawking, which I've written there. I only put two formulas in my uh, uh, slides. One is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Newton's uh, law of gravity. But this formula, this is something that is going to be engraved on Hawking's uh, tombstone. It is uh, the formula which tells, uh, gives uh, the so-called entropy of a black hole uh, in terms of the area of its horizon, that is the A and G Newton is the Newton's constant of gravity and H bar is Planck's constant. And there's actually the speed of light, which I've omitted, but uh, you can put that back in. So uh, one of the triumphs of string theory has been to give an explanation for this uh, Hawking's uh, discovery. Uh, and um, so you can see in string theory, we are bringing together the very, very large uh, things about the macrocosmos, black holes, and so on, to the very, very small, which is described by, quant uh, by quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, and uh, Stephen Hawking's great contributions have helped to uh, uh, further this understanding. Before I finish, in my last few seconds, I just want to make uh, 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 tell you a little bit about India's role in the string theory efforts in the world. And perhaps not many people are aware that outside the US, perhaps the single most influential community of string theorists worldwide are in our country, in India. Uh, and uh, they are be pushing the subject, the frontiers of the subject in different directions, uh, and Indian researchers have made uh, important connections of string theory to cosmology, the study of the universe, to black holes, to even uh, the connections of string theory to solid state physics, mathematics, and so on. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it gives a special thrill that here in India you are able to push the frontiers of knowledge and create uh, lasting knowledge. And uh, uh, for many of you who may not have heard, I, I feel a person, who, uh, a string theorist, one of India's foremost string theorists is a name every Indian should know, and it's Ashok Sen, who works at the Harishchandra Research Institute, who has been one of the pioneers of string theory. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that's something every Indi Indian should feel genuinely proud of. So thank you very much, and perhaps I'll see some of you on the trek.